Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers and the scientific committee of the school for the invitation, in particular Nikolai and Jedev. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back to Marseille. It's a, and to Surm, it's a wonderful place. I always have pleasure to <coughs> come back here and see uh, old and young faces. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so my course we will also talk about free normalization. Uh, so let's say the renormalization dynamics, because actually renormalization is something is a trend that started in physics. <coughs> and basically the idea of this mini course is the following. I'm going to tell you the same history two times. So basically I'm going to tell you a kind of meta theorem. Uh, concerning normalization, and then I'm going to explain this meta theorem with two concrete results about different objects. So it will be the same strategy that I'm going to uh, explain twice somehow. <coughs> so um, let me uh, start with uh, examples of normalization. So uh, some examples. Um, And so what is the basic idea of renormalization somehow? Um, so the basic idea is the following, is that you have a kind of uh, space S. So let me, F, which is a family <coughs> of systems. So for now I'll be very vague and then I'll try little by little to, to give concrete examples. But it will be a family of dynamical systems, say <coughs> rational polygons with some combinatorial data which is fixed, or uh, families of uh, dynamically definite contour sets. Uh, <coughs> and then on this family, uh, you have <coughs> a nice kind of zooming in operation <coughs> let me call it R <coughs> which is not defined maybe it's only partially defined but I mean I'm not very rigorous by now but that's the idea <coughs> uh, so that the dynamics of those members <coughs> of the family uh, with nice behavior under the iterates of R can be uh, reasonably described. <coughs> so the idea of normalization is that to have a family, so which is like what people call the parameter space of dynamical systems. Uh, in general, you are not able to say what is the dynamics of every single member of this family, but uh, <coughs> there is a nice way of uh, zooming in into the geometry of this uh, systems on the phase space of the systems. And if this normalization behaves well, I mean, if this parameter behaves well under R, then the idea is that from the knowledge of what's happening on the parameter space, you are able to get information on the phase space. And so this is, uh <coughs> so this idea, this kind of idea, this philosophy, <coughs> Uh, well, as I told you, originally coming from physics, <coughs> uh, is nicely uh, summarized by a phrase that I mentioned in the <coughs> abstract of my mini course. <coughs> is nicely summarized by the following phrase, which is. Uh, 
we are going to see this in this course. So plow <coughs> in the parameter in the phase space to harvest in the parameter space. And the mathematician who said that was uh, a famous French mathematician, Adrien Doadi, who contributed a lot for many subjects, including complex dynamics, where renormalization also plays an important role. <coughs> okay, um, so, so for now this is very vague, so let's start giving examples that I'm not going to detail because this is not the goal of the course, but I think it's worth mentioning. Uh, so let me mention uh, examples. <coughs> so actually, the first example of this kind of normalization ideas, as far as I know, goes back to the theory of quadratic, so in the theory of quadratic forms, so in number theory. Uh, several mathematicians, uh, including many famous names, so including Lagrange, Gauss, and many others, they noticed they used the idea that uh, uh, the idea that uh, if you have a quadratic form Q and you evaluate and you are interested in the values of this form. So a quadratic form is a form of uh, homogeneous of second degree and a certain number of variables. And you want to understand the uh, values of this form, like uh, x squared minus 2y squared, on integral points. And the idea is that <coughs> this operation here, uh, to compute these guys, you don't have to consider a single guy, but you can put them in families. And this is a very old idea. Uh, so how do I put this thing in families? I change my form by <coughs> just composing it with uh, G, which is any matrix in SL uh, NZ. Okay, because SL NZ uh, preserves this set. But now the idea is that I'm, I'm <coughs> when I'm studying the values of a form, I'm not restricted to a single parameter but I can look at the family of guys, and this seems just to be transferring the difficulty from one side to the other, but uh, there is a gain here, a non-trivial gain. That's what people notice. <coughs> okay, and if you want, uh, why? Because for some Gs you can, uh, so let me just throw keywords, and you can ask me later or look at the reference, but the keywords is that, uh, uh, so that, uh, you can replace Q by uh, QG in a sort of canonical form, but the correct name is not canonical, it's a reduced form. So this is what people call redu reduction theory for quadratic forms. <coughs> to get information on Q, Z. And the reference here are probably, there's a classical book by Dixon. And you can also look at uh, the whole body of works around uh, Margulis' uh, proof of Oppenheimer's conjecture. <coughs> so those are keywords if you want to understand better this. this thing. No. So the second example that I want to mention is uh, closer to dynamics. <coughs> and this is uh, Arn uh, Hermann's uh, Hermann-Yokos Hermann theory of uh, circle diffuse. So the idea is that Arnold uh, established uh, in the 50s, 60s, I don't remember precisely the date, uh, that uh, smooth 
circle diffuse <coughs> with uh, Diophantine rotation number. <coughs> so basically, the rotation number is what you get by taking a point in the circle, iterating the map, and comparing the cyclic order that you get for the points with the cyclic order for a given rotation. And if this number is uh, ir irrational and diophantine number, uh, then uh, you can actually linearize this map, <coughs> provided it's close <coughs> to the corresponding rotation. Sorry? Ah, not yet. <laughs> it, it, it will come later. Th this is just some generalities to show how renormalization appears, but yeah. I'll remember <coughs> that later. But uh, you can think of as a, a number which is very hard to approach by rationals. So alpha minus p over q is at least constant times a power of q. <coughs> um, <coughs> OK, so uh, if you are close uh, to the corresponding rotation, so r uh, smoothly. Uh, conjugated to the rotation. So in other words, if you allow yourself to change glasses, uh, there is no difference between a smooth circle diffio and the rotation itself. So by, a change, by a smooth change of coordinates, the things are the same. But are not imposed this condition of closeness. So it should be very, very close to start with. And then Hermann discovered that you can get rid of this closeness condition by normalization. So what he did is the following. What is the last word here? Uh, rotation. Sorry. Yeah, my handwriting is. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, the idea is that the hermann cos theory, <coughs> that I'm not going to detail because, I mean, this is a entire, uh, yeah, this is a <coughs> more, uh, more than 200 page paper in the asterisk book of uh, 195 pages. So <laughs> I'm not trying to explain all this theory here, but I'm going to say some buzzwords. So it's a theory that started uh, in 79, even though Hermann never admitted that he was using renormalization because uh, he didn't like the way people were quoting renormalization, claiming that the physicists were claiming that they were proving things with, without really proving. So he was disgusted by this attitude. And so he refused to use renormalization in his work, but the renormalization idea were there. And so what, they, what he did is uh, say, yeah, so this here says that the closeness assumption <coughs> is uh, not necessary. And so the, what is the idea? The idea is the following. The idea is that he starts with a circle diffio, F, <coughs> and my circle be identified with uh, the flat circle. So my origin is zero, not exponential to pi i zero, which is one. <coughs> and then the, his idea was basically, I'm going to uh, look at return times of this map to nicely chosen intervals. And so basically what he did was the following. He looked at the interval of this form, f uh, q n minus one zero, f q n zero, and look at the return time of this thing. Uh, here, q n, p n over q n are what people call the convergence. <coughs> convergence of the rotation number alpha of this guy. So this is what people call the continued fraction expansion. So this number is irrational, so it has a, a continued fraction expansion. <coughs> okay, and so he was taking these times given by these denominators, looking at the return time, and then uh, bring, gluing the endpoints, and then bringing this little circle to full scale. So this is the renormalization. So you see, the space F here would be the space of 
smooth circle diffuse. The renormalization operation is this operation of selecting one of these guys, say Q1 and Q0, and then gluing. And so this would be the renormalization n times. I'm just simplifying. Then you get a new circle diffuse that you control very nicely. In particular, you know that the rotation number here, alpha, goes to a circle diffuse whose rotation number is uh, alpha n, so which is the, just the continuous fraction that you get by forgetting the first n letters and looking at the rest. <coughs> so in other words, for those who know a little bit of continuous fraction, it corresponds to apply n times the Gauss map to this guy. <coughs> and moreover, if you apply uh, under this Diophantine assumption, you can check that these maps not only uh, you control perfectly what's happening to this thing, uh, but you know that uh, because of this effect of scaling, you can check that the, the nonlinearities of F are getting destroyed more and more. So this is what people call the Schwarzen argument of your course today. But the idea is that by, if your function is oscillating a lot, by doing renormalization, you spread this oscillation, so it, it oscillates less and less. And so you get closer and closer to the linear model, to, the, to get closer and closer to a fine. And then <laughs> the idea of Hermann is, okay, I have renormalized by doing this idea of gluing these endpoints here to get a new circle. I get a map with a nice rotation number plus closeness to the rotation by doing calculation. I mean, it's not obvious, but <laughs> far from it. <laughs> But uh, you do this calculation, and this is close, closer to rotation than F. And actually, from the last, last step, it's got closer and closer. And so by applying R node, you know that you can linearize this map. But this operation is invertible. So you can basically bring this conjugation back into this process. And then you linearize it, so you conjugated this guy to a rotation. So basically, the idea of Hermann and Yokos was to apply renormalization to get closer and closer to a place where you can linearize and then bring back. And so this is the idea, that for the parameters that you can control on the renormalization, you got nice information. <coughs> Another example, so I'm... I'm uh, how regular should F be? Ah, good question. So the question was, how regular F should be. It depends on how Diophantine your number is. And uh, basically the idea is that if you have a map which is CR and a very nice Diophantine condition, then you basically lose uh, two derivatives plus something. Okay. In your conjugacy. In your conjugacy, yeah. So the conjugacy is a little bit less smooth, but uh, so in particular, if you talk about C infinity, then it, yeah, you don't have to think, <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you for the question, yes. Yeah, it's, <coughs> it's not a, uh, so now I'm going to give examples which are closer to what I want to do in this course, which is to explain this kind of principle, uh, but with easier examples, because this theory is, I, I love it. Uh, I like the authors in particular, but uh, it's hard to explain in a mini course. So I think there are sim simpler things to explain, yes? No, I, I'm zooming the interval where I'm inducing. So I, I'm, I'm looking at the return map of the orbits to this little interval, and then I'm zooming that and gluing the ends. But the, the, the zero, yeah, exactly. So the, the, yeah, the, the, the effect of zooming in is bigger and bigger, and this is why these things converge to a fine, because actually the zooming the affine procedure is stronger than the nonlinearities in the beginning. But to, to see this, you have to do lots and lots of calculations. Actually, there is what Sullivan called in the initial version of uh, Hermann, the miraculous cancellation <laughs> that actually your cause explained you was just a computation with the chain rule for the Schwarzen derivative. But anyway, <coughs> example three. So this is a very Marseillais uh, example. Uh, the win three model. Ah. <laughs> so 
So wind free model, so which a, which a model introduced by Poe and Tatiana Renfest <coughs> in 1914. So the idea is that you are doing like Rick Schwartz, playing billiards in polygons, but so actually I'm playing a billiard in an infinite table, so I'm taking a Z2 periodic table. So meaning the centers of these things are uh, integral points, and these lines are the same, A and B. And A, B can be any numbers, you pick them between zero and one. So if you take these numbers too close to zero, you have basically nothing. If you take them very close to one, you get this uh, chocolate bar with very thin strips between them. <coughs> and then there was a conjecture in the 80s, actually, by Hardy and Weber. So this is not the Hardy that you might think. So number, not number theories, but physicists from Orsay. <coughs> that if you start looking at a, a, a random direction, and you start playing the billiard for a certain time. So if this point P is here is P and theta, and after time T, I reach the point phi, T, theta, P, like that notation. Uh, the conjecture was that the diffusion, so the, the speed at which these orbits goes to infinity, should be different from the Brownian motion. So if you had a Brownian motion on the plane, <coughs> then this quantity here, should be one half. So the idea is that you are spreading by the uh, central limit theorem, so square root of t, so if you take log, it's one half. Uh, the conjecture of those guys is that this thing is not one half. And actually, this was proved by Delacroix, Hubert, and Lelievre, so the, that's why I said this was a very Marseille theorem. <coughs> uh, actually, they proved that this number is not only different from one half, but it's equal to two thirds, so different from one half, <coughs> uh, and bigger than one half. And actually, uh, how they did it, the idea is the same, more or less. This family of tables, you can do the unfolding procedure explained by Rick to think of a uh, flow happening on a translation surface of genus five, not two, <laughs> so a little bit more complicated, but still. And uh, by analyzing how trajectories on this surface uh, behave, you can reach this number. And uh, people can complain, well, maybe you don't need this renormalization technique. You can kind of guess two thirds from three is four minus one and two is four over two. And uh, the next theorem shows that, uh, well, life is not easy. <coughs> and so uh, renormalization on translation surfaces. So I, I'm just putting the buzzwords here. Okay, so that's how you get this theorem. And this theorem is for all, for all A, B, and for uh, almost every theta and P. <coughs> okay. So this is interesting because if this obstacle is very tiny, you might imagine that there is long lines for which the time should be one. And if you have this chocolate bar where f with thin strips, then it should take more time, but no, the answer is the same, no matter what A and B are. But then the Lacroix and Zorich show that you need the renormalization to explain this number. Because if you start taking out one of three obstacles and repeating this partner, and you ask for the same rate, then this number now is a uh, very easy number to guess, right? It's uh, 491 over 1053. That you can, of course, cook up from this <laughs> two, three, and blah, numerology. Okay, so, and it, which is less than one half. This is less than 500, and this is bigger than 1000. So, yeah, this changes with the table, but still you can get answers from renormalization. Um, 
Another example, which is more for the experts uh, in algebraic geometry. So there is a idea. I mean, there is, these ideas were also used by, so example four. <coughs> there was a nice uh, article, I mean, uh, uh, actually book by Delin and Mosto from the 80s also, uh, where they constructed, constructed uh, a number between uh, seven and nine. Uh, commensurability classes of uh, non-arithmetic <coughs> lattices of P U1 to 1. So there is this Lie group P U to 1. So complex matrices preserving a form of signature to 1. Inside this group, you have what people call lattices. So discrete subgroups with finite covolume. And uh, most of the constructions were kind of uh, coming from number theory and they were arithmetic. So at the time, people were impressed by the linear Mosto because they kind of uh, got out of the box by giving many examples, actually 15 examples. But for some of these uh, examples, they, know, they knew that they were what people call commensurable. So commensurable means that <coughs> you take one of them, you conjugate the other, the intersection has finite index in both. So they are basically like uh, commensurable numbers. <coughs> commensurable. And uh, one thing, uh, and, and then how they knew that uh, they, out of these 15, they had something between seven and nine examples was because they could distinguish these commensurability classes by two invariants. So one invariant was co-compactness, because it's easy to check that uh, compactness is not changing by finite index. Uh, the other invariant was what people call the degree of the trace field. Okay, so basically you look at the matrices in this guy, you compute the field generated by the traces over Q and the, the degree should match. <coughs> but they could, not they could not decide what, what was the correct number, seven, eight, or nine. And there is a recent result of Kappes and Muller from 2016, if I remember correctly that say that uh, there are exactly nine classes. <coughs> and for this, they needed an extra invariant. And this extra invariant is what people call uh, Lyapunov exponents for a renormalization procedure. So this is the new thing that allows you to distinguish between those guys. And uh, in some sense, the idea that they use here to build the renormalization is close to this world here. So it's inspired by what happens to the moduli space of translation surfaces. Okay, so this is the list of examples. Um, and as I told you, this last example is more advanced, so it's for really for people who like algebraic geometry. <coughs> and the key word is basically renormalization uh, based on what people call variations of Hodge structures. So just to scare you a little bit, I mentioned these ugly words. <coughs> but now um, I think we can start this mini course properly. And so I'm not going to talk about uh, these examples. I'm going to focus more on two basic examples. <coughs> so, <coughs> my first example is a Keynes conjecture uh, which is a uh, Mazur, uh, let me put it, Mazur and Vich theorem. And I'm putting it that way because uh, this was independently proven, it was not a collaboration. <coughs> okay, so what is this thing about? It's about uh, what people call uh, interval chain transformations. So interval exchange transformation. So IET, because I, I don't want to repeat uh, interval exchange transformation all the time. 
IT. So what is an IT? IT is a very simple system. It's just something that uh, shuffles a finite partition of an interval, and uh, the shuffling happens by translations. So basically, you have a partition of an interval. A, and then I'm going to use this opportunity to introduce notation. <coughs> so I have a partition to four intervals. So my intervals are decorated by T for top and A for letters of an alphabet, finite alphabet. And then I'm going to translate these things <coughs> to get intervals in the bottom. So I bottom A, uh, I bottom B, I bottom C, I bottom D. Okay, so this is the map, this piecewise uh, translation. <coughs> and by definition, this thing is determined by two data, so determine by a permutation. So my permutation will follow the tradition of uh, your course, uh, which is just a pair of bijections to one, two, three, or I mean D. <coughs> so by this, I mean this bijection here says in which order I put my letters on the real line. So this is A is the first, B is the second, etc. And here's the order in the bottom line. The more traditional way to write in this figure would be to pick uh, a bijection from A to itself by taking this, I mean, from 1 to D to itself. But this is not a good, a very good idea if you want to do long calculations with these things because you are breaking symmetry. And you go, when you go to math Olympiads, you know that you have to do computations very quickly, so it's a good idea to keep symmetries because I have just to do half of the calculations. And here is even more true in some sense that you get a lot of saving of complicated combinatorial discussions by just keeping the symmetry between past and future. <coughs> so this is your cause way of not breaking the symmetry. Um, so our remark is that my combinatorial data, I'm going to assume irreducible. In this mini course. So what it means irreducible is that you can't break it into uh, determined by pi and lambda ah lambda. yeah sorry sorry too fast and lambda alpha which is the length of this interval sorry yeah you need to know the lengths which are the same for bottom and top because they are tr translation copies one of the other <coughs> so if you give me the lengths and the combinatorial data then I know how to recover that picture um, and uh, Irreducible means that you can't break um, this guy into two separate interval changes. I mean, if this equality here is true, then basically this means that there is a whole set of intervals that you are playing here. <coughs> and the whole set of intervals which are playing there, and they don't play together. So basically, if you want to analyze this guy, it's specialized this one and this one separately. Okay. <coughs> so irreducibility means that I'm looking at the prime numbers of the combinatorics somehow. Okay. Um, <coughs> examples, it's always good to have examples, and this is a school, so. It's always good to have examples. <coughs> so example, uh, Rick already gave you an example of interval change, <coughs> which is the rotation by alpha on a, on a circle. Because a rotation by alpha is just, <coughs> you are just making this guy here advance.
right? I mean, if you think about the <coughs> identification, this interval here goes over, but it's mod one, so up here, and this one there, okay? So we <coughs> if you think in terms of the flat circle, a rotation is really an interval exchange of two letters. <coughs> um, definition, and actually that interval exchange transformation that I drew there, it's a kind of transformation that I, I, I wanted to draw because it's hidden somehow in the pictures that uh, Rick was talking about. I mean, they appear for translation surface of genus two. <coughs> if you look at uh, how translation flows intersect uh, well-chosen segments. Okay, but I'm not going to explain this in detail. But anyway, um, definition, uh, connection is a natural number n um, so that ut, so I'm not denoted by ut the singularities of t, so forward singularity, so the discontinuity points of t in that picture, so the boundaries of those intervals. <coughs> uh, there is a singularity of uh, t inverse, so in other words, discontinuities of <coughs> boundaries of those intervals on the bottom, uh, so that uh, T M U B equals U T. So <coughs> what is the idea? The idea is that bottom singularities are problematic for defining T inverse, but you can iterate them forward in principle because they fall into the middles of those intervals. So you can iterate them forward. So starting from bottom, I can iterate forward. And uh, if I reach a continuity in the future, then I have a connection between those singularities. Yes? Yes, <laughs> sorry, I, I'll, yeah, I'll try. <coughs> and so, uh, this is connection, and so, key. Yeah, so uh, one example of connection, uh, you can see for this case, <coughs> what happens in this case of a rotation of the circle, what it means for, for having a connection. <coughs> Actually, I'm going to answer this question <laughs> right now because I'm going to talk about kin, but it's having rationality. <coughs> uh, what do you mean by star? Ah, this is French, right? Because natural numbers in French start with zero. Oh, right. <laughs> of course, I mean, I <laughs> and I'm French, so I mean, I'm Brazilian and French, so <laughs> yeah. So I vote for <laughs> this thing. But uh, so in, in, in uh, 75, more or less, Keane was interested in these objects and he proved uh, several things. So in particular, he proved that if the coordinates of the vector lambda of lengths <coughs> are Q independent, so no rational relation between them, uh, then uh, no connections. And uh, no connections is what you need to get a nice dynamical property which is called minimality. Meaning that every half infinite orbit is dense. So I told you that some points, like the singularities of the bottom, you can't iterate backwards. Singularities of ut, you can't iterate forward. But uh, you can at least do infinite, half infinite orbits. And uh, minimality here means that every single such half is dense. So it's stronger than transitivity. Yeah? Well, I mean, it's, it's periodic, no. Okay. No, no. Ah, sorry, yeah, the question was if connection is a periodic orbit condition. No, you can connect uh, different, different things. <coughs> yeah, so in the translation surface world, it would be a, a vertical orbit, which goes to one guy to the... So a connection is a place where a break between two intervals uh, sits, lands on top of another break. Exactly, exactly, yeah. 
Yeah, in the vertical direction, yeah. That, that's the, yeah, which is the one that you look when uh, studying interval changes. If your interval changes are horizontal, yeah. Yeah, you, you build it, yeah, exactly, precisely. And so this is the result that uh, Keen got. Um, <coughs> and as usual in math, you are never happy with your results. So once you get the results, you start making conjectures. Uh, and so Keen's conjecture, Keen's conjecture, which is now I gave some spoilers. So I'm sorry for those who don't like spoilers. But now it's a theorem <coughs> by Mazur and Vich from 82. And it was proven independent by both of them. For uh, Lebesgue, almost every choice of uh, lengths, uh, the associated interval chain transformation is actually uh, uniquely ergodic. So you don't have only topological information, but you have probabilistic information. So uniquely ergodic in this, in this context means uh, Lebesgue is the unique <coughs> invariant probability measure. Okay, so this means that all points distribute on the interval according to the Lebesgue measure. <coughs> so there is no point which is visiting more one side than another and another points which are doing the opposite. Everybody's visiting the interval nicely. <coughs> and this is what we're going to prove in this mini course. Uh, I mean, at least to give a sketch of proof using hand normalization. The idea is that we have to find a nice set. I mean, we have this family, right, of systems. And we want to identify those which have a nice property. And we're going to find those parameters by requiring that a certain hand normalization is recurrent. And this is what people call major uh, criterion. And that's what we are going to see. But the idea is that we are going to locate this set of parameters by identifying it with a set of parameters which are recurrent by renormalization. And it will be relatively easy to get this recurrence because our renormalization scheme will preserve a Lebesgue me a absolutely continuous measure, so basically Lebesgue measure on parameter space, <coughs> which is finite. And so by Poincaré recurrence, almost every point is recurrent. So that's how we get uh, this thing. I mean, of course, the difficult thing is to show that this normalization operator preserves a finite absolutely continuous invariant measure. And this is what those two guys, Mizor and Vich, work hard to get. I'm going to explain these things. I'm not going to explain <laughs> how to get the finiteness of the measure. I'm just to explain to how to conclude, but. <coughs> okay. Um, now, uh, let me show you the next uh, player. The next player of this mini course. Uh, I.e., so Lebesgue is the unique. Ah, every half infinity, so half infinity, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Orbit is dense, yeah. Yeah, I'm very sorry, my handwriting is <laughs> awful. Now I'm going to explain to you the second object. So now we are going to reboot our memories, forget about interval chain transformations, and talk about contour sets of the real line, so fractal sets. So they have nothing to do with what we said so far. <coughs> but uh, the idea of this mini course is to show that uh, <coughs> they have something to do with each other in the spirit, in the sense that both are treatable by renormalization techniques. So 1.3 is a uh, stable intersections. <coughs> stable intersections of dynamical counter sets. Uh, so after 
uh, moderator and your course. <coughs> and so definition, so what is a dynamical control set? So it's the what people call the maximal invariant set that you get for uh, iterated function system. So let me explain. So these are just buzzwords for something which is very simple to see. <coughs> uh, so basically, we have a map from a finite union of disjoint compact intervals. Disjoint compact intervals. And you have a map to the convex hull of this union. Uh, which is uh, what people call CK expanding. So CK and expanding. Uniformly expanding. Is a CK expanding map. So <coughs> infimum of the derivative is bigger than one. And uh, the other condition is that this partition here is what people call Markov. So meaning that not only you are expanding the intervals, but every interval the image touches should be included in this interval. So psi i is the union, is the convex hull, convex hull of the union of the ij's so that ij intersects psi i. So if, you, if your image touches, it should contain. Okay. And there is a, also a kind of irreducibility condition because I don't want to treat systems which don't play together, uh, which is called topologically mixing. In this context, topologically mixing. <coughs> Meaning that you can build an integer, uh, some, some natural number, so that psi m i i equals i for all i. And this is important, if you've never thought about this condition. It's important that there is a single number that works for all intervals, not just a number for each interval. And as always, examples. Example one. Uh, zero, one third, two thirds, one, one, tack, tack. So here you have two intervals, i0 and i2. You have a map, which is uh, x goes to uh, 3x or 3x minus 2. So this is if you are in the first branch, and this is if you are in the second branch. <coughs> OK. So this is your psi. Uh, this map respects all rules that I set up. I mean, uh, the image of uh, each interval is the convex hull of the two intervals, so which they touch. Um, and so if you do, if you look at the points for which you can iterate this map forever without leaving the domain, this is exactly the Cantor, Cantor's middle third set. So K in this case is Cantor's middle third set. And why I chose this bizarre notation of i0 and i2? It's because uh, this number you also can think in terms of triadic expansions. And so these are the numbers whose uh, triadic expansion contains only zeros and twos. <coughs> so this is, so in other words, uh, people in real analysis already know about dynamical control sets. So they already know <coughs> dynamics. <coughs> So another example, which is uh, more interesting for number theory, and which is also interesting from the fact that uh, it's not linear, is the case of continued fractions. <coughs> uh, 
example two. So um, you can, as usual, denote the continued fraction by brackets, a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over blah, blah. Uh, and then you can define maps So let me draw the map first and then explain notation later. So <coughs> basically, uh, I'm looking at uh, the restriction of the so-called Gauss map. So Gauss map is just you take a number between 0 and 1, you take 1 over x and the fractional part. OK? So this is the Gauss map. <coughs> I mean, one of the many Gauss maps, because there is another differential geometry, at least. <laughs> Uh, and now what I'm doing is the following. I'm looking at continued fractions containing just ones and twos. So this counter set here that I'm looking at is what I also call C2, which is just a set of continued fractions containing just ones and twos. <coughs> and so if your continued fraction starts with a one, since these things uh, change orientation, uh, the smallest number that you can put after is uh, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Because the it's low in, in, in even entries, you should put the smallest, and the odd entries you should put the bigger to decrease. Because this map is reversing the orientation. So it's 1 over x. And so you can convince yourself that if you write up the continued fractions containing just 1s and 2s, the smallest one starts with 1 is this one. And this bar means periodic repetition of this string. Similarly, the biggest one that you can put is 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1. Because uh, here it should, it's an even entry, so it should be a 2. An odd entry to increase, it should <laughs> decrease, and so forth. And similarly here. And if you apply 1 over x, the effect of this thing on continued fractions, you can check, is simply to forget about the first entry. <coughs> so basically, you forget about the entry, and you start here. 1, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 1. And similarly here, you forget the first entry and you see that the boundaries are exactly these intervals, which are here and there. So this map, restricted to these two intervals, shows that this guy here is dynamically defined. And in this way, you can play this game with many other uh, partners of continued fractions. So you can look at, as an exercise that I'm going to discuss in the problem session, you can think about the counter set of continued fractions on ones and twos, which do not contain the partner one to one. So you forbid something. So, so you get a dynamical counter set because you get a kind of uh, what people call subshift of finite type. OK, but <coughs> this is the example. Um, now, um, let me explain. What is the main result that I want to reach? And for that, I need to recall the notion of house of dimension. <coughs> Just to be clear with this definition, you don't allow things like infinitude of collector. Like, so for instance, if you said, I want to look at the set K where AIs are, I don't know, prime or something like that. No. This is not. Gonna no, be this is not dynamical for me because I really want a uniform hyperbolicity. And so if I allow infinitely many guys, then uh, theory is more complicated, yeah. But at least these things are good enough for approaching your types of sets, because uh, many non-uniformly expanding maps can be approached from inside and from outside by 
expanding maps. This was noticed, for instance, in dynamics by Katok, I think, that you can approach non-uniform -hyper non hyperbolic sets by horseshoes. So this is Katok horseshoe theorem. But <coughs> and yeah. So now I need to talk about how to measure the sizes of uh, these things. And the notion for me will be the notion of house of dimension. And to define house of dimension, I need to introduce what is the house of measure of a set. And the house of measure <coughs> is the way, is the number that you get by trying to cover very efficiently your set. So you take the infimum over all covers, open covers, say, of diameter at most delta. And then you add the diameters of the sets that you use it to the power s. <coughs> OK? Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is the house of measure. And the house of dimension, the house of dimension, is the transition point for this house of measures. Meaning that, uh, so let me call it HD, house of dimension is the infimum of the number so that the measure is zero, which turns out to be the supremum of the numbers for which the mass is infinity. So this is a kind of, uh, for those people who studied the works of Poincaré, these are kind of Poincaré series. You are trying to cover your set very efficiently with balls, but I mean, not only balls, but you're trying to cover very efficiently your set. <coughs> and then you are trying to see for which exponent this series converge, converge or diverge. And the house of dimension is the very nice parameter where there is this neat distinction between after this parameter, these things converge and actually goes to zero. And before that, the series diverge. So it's a kind of critical parameter in the language of Poincaré. <coughs> um, I need one more definition to state the theorem and end my talk. Which is the notion of K and K tilde dynamical Cantor sets. Uh, they intersect stably if um, h k intersects h tilde k tilde for all h h tilde c1 plus alpha uh, close to the identity. So they not only intersect, but this, I mean, composing this set with h amounts to conjugated dynamics by h. So not only my sets intersect, but if I start moving a little bit these branches, the resulting counter sets still intersect. And the result, to, so to conclude, the result that I want to prove in my mini course in the second half is Moreira cos. It tells that, uh, ah, <laughs> just when I don't, don't have time, <laughs> this happens. Uh, K and K tilde with uh, sum of dimensions bigger than one uh, intersect stably for uh, typical choices of K and K tilde. Okay, so. It's a kind of almost every in the Mazurovich theorem. So basically, pairs of counter sets with nice dimensions, so which are thick enough, they will intersect stably uh, uh, sorry. after translation. You need to translate eventually. But if they are in nice position, they will intersect 
if the house of dimension is big enough. I'm going to explain next time around why this condition is needed. It's not mysterious. It's just because if the other inequality holds, then it's simply false. But I need to say two words about house of dimension. Uh, but the key idea is that these things are going to intersect for typical choices. And what is this choice of parameters? Well, there is a kind of renormalization operator. <laughs> and these parameters are those which are recurrent to a compact portion of a modular space. That's how they got this result. But the modular space is much more complicated. I'm going to explain later. It's what Sullivan called the limit geometry space. And the renormalization is complicated. Yes? Is this K, are these <coughs> K can be related to C2, or are they just supposed to be any, any kind of countersets? Uh, these here are any kinds of countersets. These are dynamical, dynamical. So. Yeah, yeah, so that, that, that's why I'm, I'm talking about uh, typical, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this is why, yeah, it's not for every single guy, but for typical choices, yeah. Uh, after translation, I mean, they need to be in good position and then they start perturbing. So the convex hull should be what call, people call linked. I'm going to explain this more in details. I just give this very vague formulation because I don't have time. But uh, next time I'll give a proper formulation and explain why this condition is needed. <coughs> and, uh, but the idea is the same. I mean, even though these objects are different from interval changes, the meta proof is the same. The meta proof is you have this family, you define a modular a mod -like space of those objects, a family, you define a renormalization, and the good parameters are those which recur to a compact part. And then you have to do something to show that most parameters recur. Here is much more difficult because the renormalization does not preserve measures. You have to appeal to Marston's theorem. Marston's projection theorem, but yeah, I think that's it. Thank, Thank you. So Psi. Uh, yeah. Example one. On the second drag block. This one? Yeah. Psi is just zero between one third and two thirds? No. No, it's three three X, right? It's not even defined. It's not defined. You don't need to define it. Ah, ah in the middle it's not defined. No, no. What about if I start off with something, you know, between um like in the middle of zero and one third, just in the mass density. I can't iterate it if Exactly. So this guy is not uh, in this counter set. So, so I, yeah, I, I, if I understood your question, I mean, the idea is that, uh, yeah, w uh, yeah, I see what you mean. I mean, basically, you have this diagonal here, right? I mean, this diagonal <laughs> here. Uh, and then uh, you can reflect this interval here. And then you, what you are you worried is about the points in pink, right? Yeah. Which are the points which after one iteration brings here. So for those points, you just take them out okay. and then take those out too. And for the second iterate, you take this thing here out. And so you see, the points where which I can iterate forever are the counter set. And all the rest are kind of disappear from my picture. Oh, this means that. Uh, ah, sorry, yeah. So what, what it means to be C1 plus alpha close. This means that actually the maps are C0 closed. So I mean, hx minus x is uh, close to 0. So we are close to identity. And then the derivatives are close to 0. And the alpha norm is also close to 0. So if you, if you don't like C holder topologies, you can think that these guys, these guys are C2 close. So C2 close means that uh, the maps are close. The, derivat the first derivatives are closed, and the second derivatives are closed. Uh, can, can you explain the second condition, this Markov thing? Yeah, Markov means that actually every time, so if you have an abstract map, so let me draw with more branches, and like that, I mean. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I just drew something random, I guess. But the idea is that you have uh, these intervals here, which are mapped to the convex hull of the union. 
And then uh, this one, which is full branched, so it covers everything. And so Markov means that actually this interval, when I uh, apply, uh, no, sorry, uh, this guy here should be more steep, so it should contain this, this union here. Should be more steep. Yeah, my hand drawings are bad, but uh, the idea is that each interval, when you apply the expanding map, it should be the convex hole of every guy that it meets. <coughs> okay. If you cross a little bit, you need to cross fully because then you're. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, your sort of your past will tell you something too much about your future. In a sense. Yeah, exactly. So what uh, what I'm forbidding by this condition is the following situation: that I iterate one interval, one of these little intervals here, and it meets I J, like that. There's a little bit which is out. This is forbidden. This is what Markov is forbidding. I mean, if you intersect, you should really contain. Um, yes? How is, it, is, how is it easy to prove that it's a dynamic compass that is actually a topological compass? Ah, good question. Uh, it's not very easy because those systems, are, as we are going to see, I mean, uh, these dynamical counter sets, they have a lot of auto similarities. So when you look at uh, smaller scales, yeah. these things kind of look the same, which is not true for a generic uh, topological counter set. So we are living in a really smallish subset of the helm of all topological counter sets. But still, those are the counter sets that we like because they, they have applications to many things, including number theory. So, <laughs> so I, I don't mind looking at particular families. <laughs> okay, one last uh, question. Yeah, Paulina? Yeah, what is typical? Then? Ah, typical. I'm not going to explain right now, but typical means the following, that you can uh, perturb the branches arbitrarily in, in this infinite topology. So we can make arbitrarily small perturbations in this infinite topology to make those guys intersect. But it's more than that. I mean, uh, what actually they prove is the following, that if you look at uh, parameter families, <coughs> of parameterizing the movements of the branches, if you take many, many parameters, then for Lebega, most every parameter, <laughs> these things intersect. So it, it, it's much more than just open and dense in the set of br branches. It's really prevalent. What th that's the correct word that Milner likes. But yeah, no, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's like in the interval chain transformation case. You fix the combinatoric first. So you fix the translation surface, on the type of the translation surface, and then you change parameters. But yeah, so you fix the combinatorial type of the shift. So you fix the transition matrix, if you wish. But then you change the branches within that type. And that's what they prove, that you can perturb the branches so that the... Yeah, for, for any fixed topological type. Yeah, actually, the complement. I mean, yeah, actually, the, the, the complement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are just perturbing the functions, and maybe a little bit the boundaries, but uh, the number of branches is the same. So if you start with, say, k, which has three branches, and this one has four, then you are just perturbing these three branches and these four branches, but you keep in the end three branches and four branches with the same combinatorics of intersections of intervals. Okay, I think um, we need to stop, otherwise we Yeah, otherwise, yeah. <laughs>